Well, good evening. Let's stand together. Psalms 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and let all that is within me bless his holy name. Let's sing this together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord.
worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Father, help that to be true in our lives, that no matter what circumstance we are going through, God, that we would continue to worship your name, to bless your name, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. And God, that's what we want to do tonight. Praise you for who you are. Praise you for what your name means and what it teaches us about you, God, that you are a God who saves. You are a God who provides. You are a God who is slow to anger, who is merciful. God, help us to trust in that name. I thank you that we were able to call on that name and be saved. But God, help us to call on that name each and every day. I thank you that you desire to have a relationship with us. And God, I thank you for tonight that we can meet with you and open your word and to, to learn from you tonight. Lord, speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Teach us in these next moments. We love you and we praise you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good evening. Nice to see you all here tonight. If you did not get a handout, there may be a couple left back there on the table. If you want to pick one up, follow along with us. Take your copy of God's Word, please. Find Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. And uh, we are working our way, uh, not quickly, through this wonderful uh, letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a group of believers in Ephesus, uh, a group that he loved, a group that he spent a lot of time with as he was working uh, by God's will to establish this church there in the city of Ephesus, a cosmopolitan city, a city that was filled with sin, uh, a city that had its challenges, but God rose up a great church there, and we get to read about uh, that church and this letter to that church now and today and apply it to our lives. So I'm thankful for that. You know, I started a couple of weeks ago with this saying, to appreciate the blessings of salvation, we must remember our previous condition. To appreciate the blessings of salvation, we must remember our previous condition. You know, the Apostle Paul wanted the believers in Ephesus to be absolutely convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that God did something magnificent, that God did something great for them when he saved them. For this reason, the apostle ex expended considerable effort in the first half of Ephesians to enumerate the blessings of salvation through faith in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And so we spent about 10 weeks actually working our way through that catalog of blessings listed in chapter number 1, beginning with the summary found in verse number 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ uh, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so, brothers and sisters, we are a blessed people. Do you agree with that? Say yes. yes. Or amen. Either one is fine. We're a blessed people. Salvation is, in fact, the single greatest gift that any of us have received. Amen. And the second greatest thing we've ever been given isn't even close to that. Right? Right? Salvation is, is, the, is the greatest thing I've ever received in my life. The second greatest thing I've ever received in my life is my wife. And I love my wife. And we have a wonderful relationship and a, and a marriage that I, I thank God for. But even that relationship doesn't compare to the, to the salvation that I've been given in Christ. And she would say the same thing about me, except I might be third or fourth. I don't know how that works. But, but as we turn to chapter number two, we saw that the, the apostle did not only want us to understand the blessedness of the gift that we've received, but also to understand how unworthy and how helpless we were when we received it. Listen, it's not that we were mostly good when we were saved. 
It's, it's not that we just simply needed God to nudge us in the right direction, that we were kind of trending that way and we needed Him to come alongside of us and, and nudge us so that we would get on the right path. And It's not like that at all. Neither does this passage teach us that we were morally and spiritually neutral. And we had to simply just choose the way we wanted to live and who we wanted to live for, who we wanted to follow. According to God's Word, every person who now believes prior to salvation was dead in their trespasses and sins. That's chapter 2, verse number 1. And you, who is the you to which he's referring? Goes back to verse number 19 of chapter number 1. You who believe. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were, as I said a few weeks ago, we were spiritually dead. This was the ongoing reality of our condition before we were made alive in Christ. We, we did not have spiritual life that only comes through connection with God by faith in Christ. We were separated from the very life of God, making us then spiritually lifeless. We were spiritually incapable. We were incapable of responding to or pleasing God. We were spiritually blind, spiritually deaf. We had a heart of stone that guaranteed that we would remain cold and unresponsive to the glory of God and the truth of the gospel even when we heard it. We were spiritually unwilling. There was nothing in us that wanted the God of the Bible. Instead, we, we wanted to worship gods of our own making. We were not seeking for God, nor were we willing to surrender to Him and trust His Son for salvation. But by God's grace, someone came along in your life, someone came along in my life, and they proclaimed the word of truth to us. They proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and by that, the Holy Spirit opened our eyes, allowed us to see it as truth, and He called us to Himself in salvation. What a glorious thing. What a wonderful thing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. The word dead in verse number one means that we were physically alive, but that we existed in an ongoing state of helplessness. We existed in an ongoing state of hopelessness. Yes, we existed as the, the crowning jewel of God's creative act. Yes, we were image bearers of God, but we did not know Him. We did not want to know Him. We were incapable of knowing Him, and we were to a degree satisfied that way. Now, I wish I could tell you that the, the verses that we're going to walk through tonight bring a little good news to us. They do not. Instead, Paul drills down a little deeper into our previous condition. And he does so to show, again, how genuinely wretched we were. He tells us that, that we were satanically influenced, children marked and characterized by disobedience, driven to fulfill the passions of our flesh, and, and we were no different than the rest of mankind. We were children of wrath. And here's the thing that we need to remember. In order for us to realize how good the good news actually is, we need to know first how bad things were. I get a little leery when people evangelize or try to evangelize other people without first talking about sin. I get a little leery when the only gospel anybody shares is uh, you know, God loves you, and God has a wonderful plan for your life, and trust God so you can live with Him in heaven without talking about sin, without talking about our spiritual deadness and separation from God, without talking about the, the need for a Savior. Listen, if you don't talk about why I need a Savior, then what do I need a Savior for? The gospel requires that we start with the bad news. That we start with the fact that, yes, God created us, but we sinned against Him. And in our sin, we were cut off from Him, spiritually dead, condemned, rightly condemned, to face His just wrath forever. The gospel begins there. We've, we've got to start there so that we understand more clearly the glory of the truth and the sacrifice of the Son for us. In order for us to realize how, the, how good the good news is, we must know how bad things were. Great contrasts bring great clarity. Let me give you an illustration. You go into a jewelry store, and you go into this jewelry store specifically for a diamond. You're looking for a brilliant, colorless, 
flawless, well-cut gemstone. And, and you, you look in the case and you see a few rows of, of diamonds. And the light in the case is, is refracted by the many facets of the diamond causing the stone to glitter and catch your eye. And a certain stone gets your attention and you call the salesperson over and you say, I want to see that stone. And before they even open the case, they're likely then to take out a a piece of black velvet cloth and lay it out on top of that countertop and smooth it out so it's nice and flat. There's no specks, there's no dust, there's no lint on that piece of cloth. And then they open up the case and they pull out that diamond. And, and they don't hold the diamond out like this in their hand so that you can see it. They don't put the diamond in your hand, although that would be interesting. Um, they, what do they do? They put that diamond right on that black cloth. And as brilliant as that diamond was before it was laid on the black cloth, what happens? The black background causes a contrast that makes the stone look even more brilliant. Does the black velvet make the diamond more beautiful? Nope. The contrast, however, allows you to see more clearly the brilliance and the beauty of that stone. That's exactly what Paul is doing here in the first three verses of Ephesians 2. The apostle first lays out the blackness of our sin, and then he lays the, the gift of salvation on top of it so that we can clearly see the brilliance of God's grace in the priceless gift of salvation that was given to us. So look with me, if you will, at Ephesians chapter number 2. I'm going to read all the way through verse number 10 just again so that we can get the context and we can see it a little bit. And you, verse number one, who were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so, then the, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here is the message, I think, of verses 1 through 3 in a, in a summary fashion. You, what you were determined what you did. What you were determined what you did. Because you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you existed in a realm of sin and disobedience, and this is the reality that characterized your life. You were not as bad as you could be. That's a big misunderstanding about this doctrine of being dead in our sins. It's not that you were always and that you were always going to be as bad as you could be, but did you live in, in trespasses and sins? According to this text, yes. That was the realm of your existence. You who were dead in the, that's the sphere of your existence, in the trespasses and sins, you were dead. And as bad as that was, Paul goes on to show that you were in a far worse position than you ever imagined yourself being in. There is an indefinite uh, adverb translated once. It's actually used in verse number 2 and used in verse number 3. We find it in those two verses, and that adverb modifies an indicative verb in both, both verses. Okay, So I know it's a little grammarly here. I'm not going to get too far in the weeds with you. But you need to remember this, that an indicative verb is a truth statement. Okay, So an imperative is something that you're being told to do. It's a command to follow. An indicative is a statement of truth. It's something that, um, that's not a command. Um, it, it is something that just needs to be told. It's something that is absolutely true. And so Paul here, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was revealing a truth that needed to be told. Indicatives are not up for debate. They're not up for reinterpretation. 
And these two indicatives that are paired with the adverb that modifies them, they actually tell us that something uh, was absolutely true about every person who believes and has been saved. So again, think through the context of this. He's writing to people who are saved, who now believe, but at one point did not. And so he's saying here that there is something, there are actually a couple things that are absolutely true of every person who was once lost but is now saved. At the same time, these indicatives tell us uh, that is some, or something that is absolutely true about everyone who does not believe and is not saved. So not only does it tell us something that is true for those who are saved, it tells us something that is true for those who are not saved. So what are those two truths? First of all, your behavior was influenced by Satan. Now, please don't get me wrong here. This is not Flip Wilson, right? The devil made me do it. You don't get to blame him, all right? But the text communicates a truth that we need to understand and know. So the, the word walked is, uh, is the first indicative verb. So in which you once walked. It's the first indicative verb here, and it's actually in the active voice. What does that mean? It refers to something you did, whether you realized it or not. So this word, translated walked, is actually used metaphorically 49 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used, and it's used literally. They walked from here to there. They walked uh, across, Jesus walked across the sea. Um, and so it's used many times, literally. It's used 49 times in the New Testament metaphorically, and it refers to the way a person lives. It refers to how a person conducts themselves. It, it refers to how they behave or their manner of living. Now, the Apostle Paul liked to use this metaphorically. He used it 32 of the 49 times that it's used that way in the New Testament. And it's used that way eight times in the book of Ephesians. So eight times you'll see this word walked in the book of Ephesians, and each time it's talking about a metaphor, it's used metaphorically to talk about a way a person lives. And clearly, Paul believed that the way a believer conducts himself or herself, the way a believer lives, is vitally important. That it's not something that should be ignored, it's not something that shouldn't be talked about, it's not something that should be relegated to lesser status. No, he actually believes that the way a Christian lives is important. Imagine that. To believe that the way a Christian lives and conducts themselves is important. But how did we once walk? That's the question. So he says, in which you once walked. How did we once walk? What characterized our behavior? How did we conduct ourselves before we received the gift of salvation? There are two actual prepositional phrases that provide the answer and give us then the clarity that we need. What are those? In which you walked, look with me, following the course of this world. What he's saying is at one time in your life, your behavior, your manner of living was literally influenced and directed by not the gospel, not the character of God, not the will of God, not the word of God, but your actions, your life, your manner of living was influenced and directed by the ethics and the priorities of the fallen world system. And, the, and the, this evil age. What does that mean? It means that there was a time in your life when you were not concerned about the things of God. There was a time in your life where the things of God made no difference to you. You, you wouldn't think twice about them. Matter of fact, there was a time in your life where if you saw somebody who actually cared about the things of God, you might have thought they were a little crazy. You might have made fun of them. You might have rejected them. You, you might have isolated them. You, you might not have had anything to do with them. Why? Because there was a time in your life where you were not concerned about God's standard. God says, I, I, the Bible says I need to live this way. The Bible says that this ought to care. I don't care about that. I don't care about the Bible. The reality is there was a time in your life when you were entirely focused on this world. You were entirely focused on what this world had to offer. You were influenced 
by the attitudes, by the habits, by the preferences, by the attractions of this world, a world that continually opposes everything that is godly. I like the way the theologian Harold Honer put it. He said, the unregenerate are found conforming to the standards of the present world order. They go along with what is fashionable and acceptable and are not out of step with the rest of the world. Hence, they embrace temporal values. They are concerned only with activities and values of the present age and are not concerned with God and eternal values or with the judgment to come. He said that you followed or that you actively, by your own will, by your own volition, you lived in accordance with the values of this world. There's a second preposition that gives even more clarity. He says, in which you walked following the prince of the power of the air. Now it gets a little deeper. Now it gets a little little more challenging, right? Because what he's saying here is that you willingly, by your own volition, lived under the influence and control of the ruler of this world. Now the evil ruler to whom Paul refers here, I believe, is Satan. He is the powerful supernatural being who has been given power over this world. Now does that mean that that's God is not sovereign, that God is not in control, that that God is not sovereign over this world and, and everything that's in it? Well, of course not. God is absolutely sovereign over all things. But God in His sovereignty has given Satan a realm over which he dwells or which he rules, but his rule, get this, and don't miss it, his rule is not absolute. His rule is limited. The realm in which Satan rules is the air, the heavenly realm. This is where the forces of, uh, of those who are opposed to God dwell and work. How do we know that? In Ephesians chapter 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We go back into the Old Testament to the book of Job, and we see that the Bible records that Satan goes to and fro on the earth, and that he literally exhibits power over the people of the earth. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, John says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so Paul, according to Paul, Before salvation, we followed or we lived under the influence of Satan. The one who creates world systems and organizes things in this world to live for sin and self and to seek meaning and satisfaction and fullness from everything this world offers. Now MacArthur noted, not all unsaved people are necessarily indwelled at all times by Satan or demonically possessed, all right? So that's not what Paul is saying here. But knowingly or unknowingly, they are subject to Satan's influence. Why? Because they share his nature of sinfulness and exist in the same sphere of rebellion against God. They respond naturally to his leading and to the influence of his demons. They are on the same spiritual wavelength. But notice, Paul then also described Satan's work on a spiritual and personal level. He says the spirit now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, it's a little frightening, right? Because Paul is saying that at this very moment, Satan, through this world system, and by a host of devils, rules over the spirit or the immaterial part of those who are lost those who are unbelievers. Again, not necessarily saying uh, demon possession, but yet it's a truth. Now, you may be wondering, now where in the world did you get unbelievers here? Where do you get the, the, the phrase unbelievers? Where do you get the word unbelievers? I don't see that in this text. Well, let me show you. Think about this. Why do people disobey? What was that? Sin, Absolutely. But think about it. People disobey because they don't believe something. 
true? People disobey because they don't believe something. Children disobey their parents. Why? Because they don't believe that punishment is coming. Right? If, if you sit there and you tell your kids, listen, you need to go clean your room. And, and your kids are like, okay, if you don't clean your room, you're going to be in trouble. And the kid doesn't clean their room, and they're not in trouble. The next day comes, you better go clean your room or you're not in trouble. Well, do you think they're actually going to believe that they're going to get in trouble? No. Why? Because all evidence to the contrary. They don't believe it. Therefore, they, they ignore you again. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. One of the things I tell young parents whenever they ask, they don't ask us very often. Uh, one of the things I always tell young parents is never make an empty threat to your child. Never make an idle threat. Never make an empty threat. If you're going to tell them that you're going to punish them if they do not do something that you've told them to do, then you had better follow that up, whether you feel like it or not. Because they come to believe then that you're not serious and they're going to do whatever they want. Why? Because they don't believe you. Disobedience is a fruit of disbelief or unbelief. Let me give you another example. The speed limit on Cleveland Avenue is 45 miles an hour. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you drive 49, 50, 52, 53, 54, but you're not going to go over 54? Why? Because you don't believe that any cop is going to write you a single-digit ticket, right? You think, no one's going to pull me over and write me a ticket for five miles an hour over. And that's been borne out and proven in your own life. Why? Because you've actually driven by police officers five miles an hour over the speed limit, they don't pull you over. But yet, you're less likely to drive 10, 11, 12 miles an hour over the speed limit. Why? Because you believe that they're going to get you for that. Obedience is the fruit of belief. Disobedience is the fruit of disbelief. And so what Paul is saying here is he says that this spirit that is now, at this present time, working in the sons of disobedience. In the same way, those who do not believe the gospel are characterized by disobedience. One commentator wrote, disobedience comes from unbelief. So the person is not persuaded or convinced to trust what has been stated. So the unregenerate are characterized as disobedient because they do not believe in what God has provided. It shows that unbelief is more than the absence of, absence of trust. It is a defiance against God. Thus, it is no wonder they are called the sons of disobedience, for they follow their commander who is the prototype of disobedience. Now, this doesn't, believe, this doesn't mean that every believer, when they come to faith and trust in Christ, lives a perfectly obedient life to the Scripture. I don't, do you? And if you say you do, I, I can take you to 1 John, where it says that you can't lie about stuff like that, because if you do, then you're sinning. All right? But here's the thing. The life of an unbeliever, according to what Paul is saying here, is in fact marked by unbelief. It is in fact marked then by disobedience. That instead of following God and His will, you follow the course of this world. Instead of following God and His will, you follow uh, the, the antithesis, the, the enemy of God. And you're influenced by all that He calls good and you in fact have a maybe a, a bit of Disdain for that which God calls good. You know what Paul is actually saying here? Is he saying that the life of a believer is remarkably different than the life of an unbeliever? That the life of one who has been redeemed through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that the life of one who has received all of these spiritual blessings and benefits in Christ, in heavenly places, that the one whose sins are forgiven, the one who is a, an heir of God, who is united to Christ, the one who is in Christ, the, the one who enjoys this relationship with Him, this one has spiritual life, and their life is then marked by following God and, and ignoring and, and, and uh, 
rejecting the God of this world and then living a life of obedience that is motivated by trust and faith in God. But unbelievers don't. Unbelievers have no use for God. No desire for the things of God. And live only for this world and everything that it promises. And in, in this, I, I think there's a little, there's a way that, that we can check ourselves to see where we are. Are we genuinely in the faith? What do you desire? Who are you following? What and who is governing your life? If, if your life, if you call yourself a believer, and your life is not in any way distinguishable from an unbeliever, there's an issue. You may have prayed a prayer at some point in your life, but prayers don't save people. You're saved by faith and trust in Christ alone. And so before salvation, we walked according to the values of this world. The worst part is we walked according to the, the wishes of its ruler, a ruler who is still working at this very moment in the sons of disobedience. And, and this truth here opens our eyes uh, and answers actually another question, and that is this. Why are things in this world going from bad to worse? Why are things so terrible? Why are things getting, from our perspective, so much worse. And I think all too often we get angry at the sinfulness of this age. We, we have this, this holy anger that wells up in us and, and we see all of this evil that surrounds us on every side. And I would say this, that righteous anger, righteous indignation is good. I believe that the believers ought to hate sin. We ought to hate sinfulness we ought, to hate, we, we ought to hate what sin does to people. We should despise the enemy and his forces that are operating this world and, and bring so much pain and suffering. We, we should hate all of that. But anger isn't the only res response required here. I think along with it, we must have pity and compassion on those who are lost and under the influence of the prince of this world. I think we need to look at this passage and come to a fresh understanding that they are what we were. Had God not brought us to Himself, who knows what kind of evil you and I are capable of. And pity and compassion then motivate us to do what? It should motivate us to share the gospel with those who are perishing. It should motivate us to share the gospel with those who are dead, living in the trespasses and sins, following the system of the world, following the God of this world, living in perpetual disobedience to God and His will. We ought to share the gospel with those who are lost and hopeless. But then I think something else. We must remain vigilant. Because just as we've been set free from sin's power over us, we can and often do surely put ourselves back under sin's oppressive thumb. Just because we're the purchased possession of God does not mean that we cannot become influenced by the world and begin to live out the values of the world and live for the things of this world so that our life then is really indistinguishable from the life of those who are unbelievers. We need to live by the command that Paul gave in chapter 6, be strong, in the Lord and in the strength of His might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And so we need to be alert and pray for, for one another that we do not walk as we used to walk. Why? Because your behavior at one time prior to your salvation was influenced by Satan. And then second... You lived only for self. You lived only for self. Now there's an interesting change in the grammar between verses 2 and 3. Paul actually moved, and here we go back into grammar again. 
Um, Paul actually moved from using second person, second person plural pronouns to first person plural pronouns. Now, what's the significance of the change? Well, if you look at it, you can see it right there, in which you once walked, but then in verse number three, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, which and were by nature the children of wrath. I believe, there, now there's several different ideas and, and thoughts about this. One of the thoughts is that Paul here was saying, hey, you Gentiles and we Jews are in the same boat, and, and that would bear itself out a little bit later in chapter number 2. I, I don't think that's what he, he's doing here, though, because of the rest of the text of these next few verses. I think Paul here is simply wanting to identify with those to whom he was writing. In other words, every human who is an unbeliever is, in fact, in the exact same state. No matter if they're Jew or Gentile, no matter if they're man or woman, no matter if they're rich or poor, no matter if they're uh, whatever ethnicity, it doesn't, matter, doesn't make a difference. Paul was no different and no better. He, too, lived in the passions of his flesh. He, too, carried, or lived to carry out the desires of his body and mind. He also was by nature, a child of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. And, you know, Paul was one who would acknowledge his own need for Christ and salvation. He knew that he was nothing before being redeemed by faith in the risen Messiah. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15, Paul, writing to Timothy, says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or 15, verses 9 and 10, For I am the least of the apostles, Unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me or with me. And then if you turn to chapter 3, verse number 8, you'll see to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul identified with them in their previous condition. He said, listen, when they were dead in trespasses and sins, like uh, they, like every other unbeliever, are in the same boat. All once lived as unbelievers because they were all unbelievers. And how did they live? Well, according to Paul, he said, we were living in the passions of our flesh. Now, this is the second indicative, lived, it's a little bit unlike the, the word walked, and that walked is in the passive voice showing that it was the state or the sphere in which they were continually functioning, specifically the, the sphere of the passions of the flesh. The, the word passions there refers to evil cravings that are connected with uh, and indicative of sinful humanity. Why? Because these cravings oppose God's will. Now, how do we know that? Well, it's because the object of the word passions in this verse is our flesh. So what exactly is our flesh? Here we get into a little bit more doctrine, right? Chapter 1, 2, 3, full of doctrine. Our flesh, is it limited to the physical body? Skin, bones, blood, tendons, nerves, organs? No. Now the flesh certainly involves the physical body, but the word as it's used here refers to the whole person, not just the physical aspects of the person. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 12 tells us that the flesh is corrupt. Why? Because it is in rebellion against God. The flesh is inclined to moral excess. It is seen in Scripture as weak, powerless, sinful. The flesh is that part of us that opposes God and the very things of God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Get that? The mind that's set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And the flesh also, however, produces works. 
that are in fact contrary to the character of God. They are antithetical to the, to the Holy Spirit and the work and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, you know Galatians chapter 5, uh, many times as uh, the, the, the catalog, the listing of the fruit of the Spirit, but also there in Galatians chapter 5, you have a catalog or a listing of the work of the flesh or the fruit of the flesh. This says the works of the flesh are evident. What are the works of the flesh? Sexual immorality. This is what the flesh desires. This is what the flesh pursues. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So think through this. Those who are dead in the trespasses and sins have continual cravings that are born of their sinful flesh and they live to continually carry out the desires of the body and the mind. Now, the word desires refers to something that a person wishes to happen. Those desires or wishes, Paul said, are, are then carried out or acted upon by both the body and the mind. So let me kind of walk this out. Before we were saved, we didn't just desire to sin and gratify the flesh but we lived to sin and gratify the flesh. And our sinful activity was not accidental or forced, but we desired it, we planned, and we plotted to carry it out. That is what Paul is saying here. That, that you as an unbeliever were ruled by your flesh. It had passions, cravings that became desires that then you actively worked to carry out in both your body and your mind. So that then you would find what you believed would be fulfillment. In other words, we were willingly doing that which we reasoned and planned. And so our, our sinful activity was not just a, a lapse in judgment, according to the Apostle Paul, but deliberate, premeditated actions to gratify our flesh and to satisfy our mind. So we used our ability to reason and to rationalize to then justify our sinful activity, all the while we disregarded or suppressed the knowledge of God. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2 and Romans 1, chapter 2, verse number 15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Do you see a progression there? Can, can you follow that progression? Let me, let me see if I can put it out there for you. That a, a passion or a craving of the flesh leads to desire, something you wish to happen. And it's not just wishing like I'm throwing a, a coin in a fountain and hoping that that's going to come true, but wishing in such a way that you want to do anything and everything you can to make that thing come to fruition, to bring that thing into reality in your life, to have the experience of whatever evil craving you are, your flesh desires at that moment. And then what happens? It goes from a craving to a wish or a greater desire, which then goes into being carried out by the body and the mind.
And Paul says, this is how you lived. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is, this is what marked your life. This is what your life was about. And so what we see here is this. That in a state of spiritual deadness, there is no hope to stand against this progression. There's, there's no hope to fight against the flesh. And because of this, every person in their natural state is destined to face God's wrath. They're destined to face God's wrath. Why? For their sinfulness and the sin brought about by their sinfulness. Sinfulness is the nature. It's, it's the way we're born, fleshly. Which then leads us to sin, actually experientially. And God's wrath then is deserved. And that's what Paul says. You were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You weren't a special class, special group. You were by nature children of wrath just like everyone else. Again, Honer wrote, Paul paints a dark picture of a person without redemption. This verse pictures what a human being does. They live in the desires of his or her flesh and thoughts. And what a human being is. A child destined to God's wrath. And he concludes, the problem is both personal and universal. You, dead in your trespasses and sins, were convicted. You and your trespasses and sins were a child of God's wrath. But so is everyone else. And if the problem is both personal and universal, then the need for the gospel is both personal and universal. You needed to hear the gospel. Others need to hear the gospel. So, we who are, or who were, dead in the trespasses and sins, we basically, just to let me sum it up here, we basically did what everyone else did, and we did what Satan wanted. We walked following the course of the world. The world's going that way. I'm going that way. The world's doing that. I'm doing that. And Satan's the traffic cop going, okay, world, go that way. And the world just goes along. And, and you, me, that's exactly what we did. We just followed along. And we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, we enjoyed our sin. Why? Because according to Paul, it pleased our flesh. The flesh had these desires, these evil cravings, and we figured out a way to make sure it got what it wanted. That we got what we wanted. We would plot and plan and scheme and excuse. And all of this tells us that we were once caught in a trap that we could not escape, and worse yet, we did not want to escape. We were caught in a trap, but we were happy to be there. And as I said before, we were helpless and hopeless. We were lost. We were rightly condemned. We were, in fact, going to face God's wrath. But God. But God. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Father, thank you for our time together. 
Lord, thank you for being truthful and real with us. I thank you for showing us the depths of our sin. Thank you for not glossing over it. Thank you for not trying to offend, try, trying to, to keep from offending us. But you laid it out right here for us. We were dead in the trespasses and sins, and it was much worse than we could ever even begin to fathom or imagine. There was absolutely nothing in us that wanted anything to do with you, and Lord, we were just content to keep going the way of this world, to keep following and submitting ourselves to the system and the will and the desire of, of your enemy, Satan. Lord, we wanted to live only to gratify our flesh, and we would do anything that we could for that purpose. Lord, we did not deserve your Son. We did not deserve salvation. There is nothing in us that is worthy of redeeming. Paul said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Lord, I'm so thankful that there's good news to follow the bad. You would have been perfectly just and right to leave us right where we were. But Father, in your grace and your kindness, you sent a Savior. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray as, as we think this week about what we were, Lord, that we would also prepare our hearts and minds to consider who you are and what you've done. And Father, I pray that if there's one here right now in this, in this place or someone who's watching now or in the future, Lord, as, as they hear this teaching, they think about their own life, and the more they think about their life and examine their life, the Holy Spirit is, is prodding them, poking them, revealing to them that, that they are still dead in their trespasses. Their, their life is no different than what is described here in verses 2 and 3. That, Lord, I pray that they would call upon Christ and ask Him to save them. That they would put their full faith and trust in what Jesus did. Lord, in, in that, that they would be born again. That they would be made new creations. That they would be redeemed, forgiven, Father, that they would be reconciled to you, adopted into your family, recipients of every spiritual blessing, and Father, heirs, joint heirs with Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would do in hearts and lives what only you can do, and we'll trust you in that, and thank you for it. And God, I thank you for the time we've had together tonight. I pray that you've been glorified through it. Lord, we pray that you would watch over us as we depart from here this evening after time of fellowship, Lord, bring us back together on Sunday to worship you again. And Lord, we thank you for, for all that you've done for us. We praise, praise you in Christ's name. Amen.